Good morning, Sanctus Church. So glad that you could be with us this morning as we continue our series in the waiting and how God forms us over time. Uh, Pastor John has been insightfully uh, leading us through the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how they experience a waiting period to see the fulfillment of their promise. And so this morning, we're actually going to look at the life of Joseph. And before we go into that, I have a few questions for you. First of all, do you know why you were born? Why God created you? or the purpose of your life. Sometimes we find our calling early in life, other times it's revealed a little later in life, and sometimes other people see it even before we do. But this morning we're going to look at the life of a young man who received visions very early, and his calling came very early, but he didn't understand fully the purpose of God until a series of unexpected and painful events occurred in his life, nearly out of all of his, contr out of his control, and these events were preparing him by God for his destiny and his purpose. And so we begin in Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 and 2, where introduced to this young man, and his name is Joseph. Joseph was essentially the hero in his generation to rescue his family through a dangerous famine and preserve them. He was the hero in God's great narrative and how he was essential in keeping God's ultimate plan going. God called Abraham and formed as a family and a nation that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed and that through him, the arrival of the Messiah would come to redeem and restore God's creation to its intended end. And God in his foreknowledge and purpose prepared Joseph through difficult circumstances to be a ruler and to save his family. You see, the enemy came to destroy God's purpose and plan, but God revealed to Joseph why he was created formed, and why he was fashioned. What the enemy meant for evil, God used Joseph to turn it for good. So let's look in verse 1 and 2. It says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family's line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. From these verses, we see Joseph as a young teenager, 17 years old, working in the family business, and he had no idea of the calling and the purpose and also what he would face in his future. Now, if you ask Joseph at 17, what's the purpose of your life? He would have probably said, a shepherd, like his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather. Someone once said, the will of God is more like the sunshine than a sunburst. Out of the darkness, uncertainty, and chaos, and the confusion that is life, God's will slowly rises from the horizon, brightly shining, providing clarity and purpose. You see, the focus is not on the sun, but by the sun, we see everything else. And so is the intention of God's will and plan. Our focus is not on the plan, but how his plan unfolds and gives clarity and purpose and meaning to everything that we are to do in life. And God's plan unfolds in our lives for his glory and for his purpose. Now, when Joseph was 17 years old, he had two dreams that made his brothers so angry that they plotted his demise. In the first dream, Joseph and his brothers got, gathered bundles of grain, of which those of his brother's grain bowed down to his own. In the second dream, Joseph had a dream of a sun, moon, and stars, and the sun being his father, the moon being his mother, and the 11 stars, his brothers, all bowing down to Joseph. Now, he wasn't sure what these dreams meant, or how it would be accomplished. But he knew that one day his parents and siblings would bow down to him. Very often God's will is revealed slowly, like the sun slowly rising. If God was to reveal everything up front to us, we may actually hesitate to accept it because we may not be ready or we may be even fearful of the challenges that may be lying ahead of us. But the beauty is that God's will will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Now think about this. Joseph, he was Jacob's favorite son. He was given a coat of many colors. We read in uh, chapter 37, verse 3 and 4. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him of his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak to him. Now just remember about this coat because I'm going to come back at the very end as we look at certain coats that Joseph had. And then he was betrayed by his brothers who wanted to kill him out of jealousy. In verse 19 to 20, they plotted and they said, here comes the dreamer, referring to Joseph. And they said to each other, come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns so that a ferocious animal would devour him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. 
You see the anger and the jealousy and the envy against Joseph plotted. They plotted to kill him. But then ultimately reason and rationale came and they said, let's not kill him, but let's sell him away. And so he was sold into slavery and brought to Egypt. And in verse 28, it says, when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern, sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. And there in Egypt, he was purchased by a man named Potiphar. He was a ruler in Egypt and he worked as a steward in his house. In verse 36 of chapter 37, it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. But the beautiful thing about Joseph was in his life and his heart, God found favor with him. And it says there he rose in favor and uh, responsibility in Potiphar's house. It says there in verse 2 and 3 in chapter 39, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did. And so Joseph here is doing well. He's growing. He's getting, gaining responsibility and favor in Potiphar's house. But Potiphar's wife eyed Joseph and tried to seduce him and tried to sleep with him and kept coming towards him. And Joseph with the fear of God and knowing that God had a purpose and plan for his life, refused. And one day there was an altercation where she came to physically sleep with him and he ran away. And it says there in verse 14 and 15 of chapter 39, afterwards he ran away. She called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of his house. Now remember the importance of the cloak or the robe for the very end. And so here, Joseph flees temptation. He runs away, preserving his calling, preserving his future, because he realized that he could not do this against God, even against his master Potiphar, and he preserved himself in that moment. But unfortunately, Potiphar's wife created a false accusation of rape, and then Joseph was captured and put into prison. In verse 20 to 22 in chapter 39, we read that, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all that he had in the prison and he was made responsible for all what was done there. Again, Joseph, keeping his heart right, was able to grow in favor and responsibility even in the prison. And there in the prison, he met a baker and a butler or a cupbearer in the prison. And there, these two men had dreams themselves. And Jacob, sorry, Joseph was able to interpret it in chapter 40 in verses 5 to 7. Each of these two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, was being held in prison and had a dream the same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. And when J Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were de dejected. And so he asked J Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad? That's pretty interesting that Joseph, who'd just been sold and betrayed by his brothers, accused of rape, now in prison, is asking someone else, why are they sad? It shows Joseph had a hopeful attitude. We're going to look later on regarding his spirit. And so there, Joseph interprets the dream. And then we read about the cupbearer being repositioned back to his position with Pharaoh. But the baker, he unfortunately, was executed by Pharaoh. But before the butler or the cupbearer was sent back, Joseph gave these words. And he said to the cupbearer, please remember me when you are back with Pharaoh so that you could let me out early. But it says in verse 23 of chapter 40, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And there we read how Joseph stayed there a little longer. And he stood before uh, in the prison wondering, God, what was happening? And a few years later, the cupbearer remembered. And when Pharaoh had a dream and Pharaoh had a dream about uh, famine coming and plentiful coming. And we're going to, we can see that in the story in chapters 41. And then we see that Joseph is brought to interpret that dream in chapter 41, verse 39 to 42. After Joseph interprets the dream and says to Pharaoh, Egypt is going to have seven years of plenty, 
but then seven years of famine. And so prepare for the years of famine. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you, and you shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, hereby I put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring, put it in his, on, from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And then we read how eventually Joseph meets his brothers and he forgives them and he gives his family a home and a place to stay. At the very end, Joseph was able to preserve the line of promise. Now I went through quickly the, the key highlights, the moments of Joseph's story. But if you go back to the very beginning when Joseph was taking care of the flock, he had no idea of the tragedy and the trials he was to face and how his life would turn around. Joseph was given a promise and he had to wait till the fulfillment of that promise. And it took many years. He had to be in a period of waiting. From the plains where he was taking care with his brothers, the, the, the flocks and where he was out there, to the pit, to Potiphar's house, to the prison and to the palace, Joseph went through stages of his life. Now, many of us, we want to go from the plain to the palace. We want, when God gives us the promise, we want the, the palace. But we have to understand there is a process. And Joseph experienced three significant trials. He experienced the trial in the pit. He experienced a trial in Potiphar's house. And then he experienced a trial in the prison. And so this morning, let's dig a little deeper into Joseph's story and the process. See, Joseph was raised in a very dysfunctional home. His father had basically four wives, two of them which were his concubines he married. Joseph had 11 brothers and one sister scattered among these four wives. And he only had one full brother, the youngest of them all, which was Benjamin. Now, can you imagine the dynamics of this family? It's a recipe for disaster that was brewing there. The beginning of the story that we read was already showing signs of contention and trouble, but no one would have imagined that Joseph would be betrayed and that he would be even betrayed and desired to be killed and sold away. Now, one thing important that we should all understand regarding Joseph's life and background is that regardless of our family history, regardless of our background, they are not an impediment for God's calling and ministry in our life. Regardless of our fa own family dysfunction and our own background, it does not hinder what God can do and use you in your own life. You see, the purpose, our purpose in life is to fulfill God's purpose through God's given gifts and abilities. And God enables this by His grace and by His Spirit. And we can try with our own human effort, but we'll fail and feel frustrated. But it's through the empowering of His Holy Spirit that we can experience the fullness of God's plan and purpose. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 and 11, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, let they should do so as one speaks out of the very words of God. If anyone serves, let them do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory forever and ever. And Joseph was one that he had the ability to have dreams himself, to interpret dreams, and God gave him the gift to lead a nation. And God used him and God allowed him to use his spiritual gifts in critical moments. And we've all received gifts. And I want to encourage and ask you, are you using your spiritual gifts? Are you using your natural gifts for God? Are you serving in the church and outside of the church and using what God has called you to do to fulfill his purpose? I'd like to show a little sermon demonstration this morning about how God works in us and we partner with God in fulfilling his purpose. And so I actually have Pastor Robin with us, our Port Perry site pastor, and she's going to join me here this morning to do a little demonstration. And so this demonstration is going to be interactive. Thank you, Pastor Robin. My pleasure. For being here. I'm going to ask you to hold uh, this. This is the plan of God. This is what God has, has for our lives. And we're going to do a little... Some, some number game with, with okay. you. And so we have the plan of God. And with the plan of God, we, we see that he has a calling for each of us, a unique calling. And so let's just say this unique calling is this, this number. And then we interact with God by using our spiritual gifts. And as we use our spiritual gifts, he leads us by his spirit. And as he leads us by his spirit, we are to obey the leading of the spirit. And as we obey God's grace, continues to flow in us to fulfill the plan and the purpose of God in our lives. So, Pastor Robin, 
there's a calling number. I'd like you to also help me to give me a four-digit number. Give me first two numbers. Seven. Seven. One. Okay, give me another two. Three, four. Three, four. And so, Pastor Robin, by the way, did I give you these numbers before? No. No. I have no idea what is happening. <laughs> okay, great. So we have here Pastor Robin's chosen numbers for the spiritual gifts. But then the leading of the Spirit, God comes in and He gives His his number, and he comes and leads us in how he purposes his will for our lives. And so as the Spirit leads you, Pastor Rob, as the Spirit leads all of us, how are we to respond? In obedience. Okay. If we disobey, that's how we read in Scripture people going away from the purpose of God and not fulfilling God's call and God's purpose in their life when we don't obey. Mm -hmm. And so can you give me another two more numbers? Two, four, nine, nine. 2499. And so here Pastor Robin has given her obedience to the Lord. And then when we obey the Lord, we see grace flows. Grace will come into our lives. Mm -hmm. And so and then grace, the Lord provides his grace for us. And as the grace of God flows, we want to see the plan of God. So I'm going to ask you. I know you have your hands full there. We're going to add all these numbers up. Okay. All right. I'm going to pull out my calculator and those watching online or in service can take out your calculator yep. and start adding these numbers. Maybe there's some mathematicians who can do <laughs> who can this in their head. In. <laughs> yes. Good for you. All right. And remember, Pastor Robin gave her own numbers and... Two thousand twenty three thousand eight hundred and fourteen. And so that's how as humans we work in, with God as God's calling in our lives. We use our spiritual gifts. He leads us the obedience of God, uh, obedience, our obedience to God and his grace supplies to fulfill ultimately his destiny, his purpose in our lives. So Pastor Raman, do you mind opening and seeing what's inside that piece of paper? Sure. Oh my God. <laughs> Is that the same number? Oh my. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> so one thing to understand is, you're all wondering, it's probably understanding of the interpretation and the function of how numbers work together mm. and how God has a unique call and number in our lives. And when we interact of our own choosing and our own abilities and our own willingness, God is able to work towards his ultimate good in our lives. God is interacting with our choices mm -hmm. and will that is necessary for the outcome that he wants and his purpose in Joseph's life. We read in Joseph's life how certain decisions, even by others, mm -hmm. would have seemed detrimental, but God was working it through Joseph's own obedience and Joseph using his spiritual gifts to ultimately come to the very end where he saves his family. And we read in, in, in Genesis where Joseph says, you meant for evil, but God meant it for yeah. good. And that's the trust we have in the plan and purpose of God. So thank you, Pastor Robin, thank for joining you. us. You can maybe take this with you as well. Thank you so much. And so as we see this and understand that God works with us and ultimately leads us to his plan and purpose, I love how one pastor shared these two important truths. He said, when God chooses a leader, he often allows enemies to rise who will put them to the test. Where did Joseph's enemies come from? His worst enemies came from the people who should have been the closest to him, his own flesh and blood. He wrote this and said, What started as hatred congealed into envy, which resulted into conspiracy, which, result, which led to violence, which was compounded by callous indifference, which ended up in a shocking betrayal, which was covered with an evil deception. The second point is when God chooses a leader, not even his enemies can stop him from doing God's will. Nothing that the brothers could do to cancel God's choice Behind Jacob's favoritism, behind the strange dreams, behind the brother's evil scheme, behind the false accusation by Potiphar's wife, behind the time in prison, stood the God of the universe, working his will. What Joseph endured was a waiting, a testing of perseverance, where God was developing his character through the trials and testings and temptations and troubles that we all face. 
When Joseph was going, what, what Joseph was going to do ultimately in his calling and purpose required immense character, immense resilience and wisdom to function. And this 17-year-old privileged boy with a beautiful coat was not ready, even though he received the dream at 17, his character was not ready to inherit the fulfillment of the calling on his life. What God was doing in Joseph's life was a period of waiting to form character, to support his calling. God's calling was so great and too important to have someone with weak and unstable character like Joseph's own brothers. And so we're going to look here at the formation of character in our lives in the waiting period, in the time that God may cause us to wait over a period of time. And we find this beautiful verse in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. It says, Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. The two Greeks word for glory, uh, the first one is mentioned 138 times in the New Testament. It means outshining, showing the glory of God. But the second meaning means rejoice, to wish for, to pray. Simply, it means we should wish for and pray for suffering that causes us to rejoice. Now, I don't know about you, I don't think we all wish for or pray for suffering in our lives. Why in the world should we rejoice or pray for suffering? Well, here it says suffering produces perseverance. You know, you don't have to wish or pray for suffering. It's going to find you. It's going to be there. James 1 verse 2 says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials. Even Jesus in John 16 and 33 says, uh, In this world you will have trouble. Suffering produces perseverance, and in order to persevere through trials, we need patience. Now, patience is not just waiting, because, you know, anyone can wait. wait. Patience is an attitude that we have that keeps our heart right with peace and joy while we wait for something. It's, wait, patience is an attitude which is important because, again, anyone can wait, but we have to wait with patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It is through patience that we have perseverance and characters formed. I like how one author wrote, when thinking of perseverance, he, he said, picture a muscle. To make any muscle grow, you have to bring resistance to it. And when you bring resistance to that muscle, it tears. And initially, it gets weaker and sore. But through the soreness, what happens? The muscle grows back stronger in order to handle resistance more easily. And this is like God's work in us through suffering. Suffering of any kind truly feels like we're being torn apart and becoming weaker. And in true sense, in essence, it is doing that to us. But what happens through the soreness of suffering is that God grows us stronger and makes us more able to endure even more challenges and become more resilient even until the very end. Suffering produces endurance. And that perseverance through something can be for a long period. For Joseph, it was at least 13 years. Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold to Egypt. He was 30 years old when he was made a ruler. So that was about 13 years of trials and sufferings. Then 39 when his brothers first came to him. If you remember, it was in the second year of the famine. So that was 7 plus 2. That's about 39 years old. And he was probably 40, um, 41 uh, uh, when... when the second time when his brothers came and he met his father, Jacob. And then Joseph died when he was 110. So Joseph suffered for 13 years. Remember David. David was anointed king, but he had to run from Saul for about 13 years. Paul was in Antioch for 13 years before he went on his first missionary journey. Now, some of you may be thinking, I'm going through a trial longer than 13. Well, Abraham had to wait 25 years. Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years. And the book of Hebrews writes about how some people do not fully see the fullness of their promise even in this life. And Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 says, All these people still living by faith when they died, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. So the question is, will we still persevere if our expectations are not met or the promise of God does not unfold the way we hoped for or wanted? And so suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character. Remember the story of a, someone going to a pastor and said, Pastor, can you pray for me? I need more patience in my life. And the pastor responded and started praying and said, Lord, I pray for great trials and great tribulations upon this person. And, you know, you may smile and laugh about that, but that's the essence, as Scripture says, 
It's through suffering that produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. Now, we may not like enduring through suffering, but perseverance through suffering reveals and unveils things in us that we may have not known. We've ne we may have not thought that we're actually as patient as we thought, or loving, or gentle, or long-suffering, until something happens that causes us to react a way that we didn't expect. Suffering displaces us and often unveils the worst in us, and it surfaces underlying sin in us. And if we're able to go to the Lord for His grace through repentance, then we see the formation of His character in our lives. Character is formed through enduring injustice, forgiving trespasses, humbly asking for forgiveness through repentance, resilient faithfulness to a call or to a purpose, maintaining, maintaining an attitude of joy even while suffering. You see, the waiting periods in our lives is a test of perseverance to produce character to support God's calling and purpose. If character is not developed, it can either prolong a trial or cause us not to successfully accomplish an assignment or fulfill His calling. 1 Peter 1 verse 6 to 7, Peter writes and says, In all this greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that to prove the genuineness of your faith. And then character produces hope. So instead of praying that God would preserve our hope through the trials and sufferings, we should pray that God would build and increase our hope through the suffering and the trial. There's a lady named Benita Risner who suffered the most in, in life, and she was diagnosed with post-polio, a painful, deliberate condition. She lost an infant son because do a doctor made a mistake. And then during the hurricane of pain and trauma she was going through, she was actually abandoned even by her husband. Yet the grace of God was upon her, and she was able to endure all that suffering with joy. And she, she writes this, and she said, I cried out asking God to help me to trust Him, to reconnect and to find hope in what seemed like an impenetrable darkness. I needed peace, and I couldn't find it anywhere besides Christ. It was then that my faith radically changed, and I found an inexplicable peace and hope that I had not experienced before. My easy, trouble-free life had not yielded anything but an enjoyment of the present, but suffering was producing something unshakable. Suffering is a catalyst that forces us to move in one direction or another. No one comes through suffering unchanged. By enduring suffering with joy, God forms our character, and this character enables us a hope and a longing for a future reality, a reality of the fulfillment of God's purpose of His grace in our lives, in our families, in our future, in His earth, in His kingdom. There's this present hope of a plan and purpose coming to fulfillment, a future hope of restoration, reunion, right, recreation and renewal. And when that hope is set before us, it helps us to endure regardless of what comes against us. That hope drives us to keep getting up every morning and pressing forward. Now, it's remarkable that even Joseph in prison, falsely accused, betrayed by his brothers, was able to maintain that attitude of joy and hope. We read that when he was in prison, those two prisoners came and Joseph asked them, why are you sad? Why are you sad? Of all the people, Joseph should have been sad. But Joseph maintained a good posture, a patient, heart-filled, fruit-of-the-spirit posture through his trials. Now, there's one important lesson I'd like to highlight in Joseph's life, a warning for us in the period of waiting. Do you remember after when Joseph interpreted the dreams for the cupbearer and the baker, he told the cupbearer, when you go back to Pharaoh, please remember me and, and bring me out early. And the important truth is that God never rewards manipulation. God never rewards manipulation. That's why Joseph said in Genesis 40, he says, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of prison. But you read that the cupbearer forgot Joseph. And it was only two years later when Pharaoh had a dream that the cupbearer remembered Joseph. And then he remembered to bring Joseph to Pharaoh. Now, let me ask you a question. Who gave Pharaoh the dream? It was God. Why didn't God give the dream two weeks, two weeks later or two months later instead of two years later? I believe that though Joseph was in the prison, ministering to the prisoners, finding favor with God the, and, the, and the prison guards, he tried to drop a hint to the cupbearer, please remember me. And God said, oh, quite not ready yet. Because if I promote him now, he will think that he got ahead in life by dropping hints and manipulating situations. God waited two years because I believe Joseph's character was not ready to support his call and purpose and position. It's God's mercy that he didn't 
uh, put Joseph in that place of authority before his character was ready. Uh, Psalm 75, 6 and 7 talks about how promotion comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from the east or the west, the north or the south, but the Lord exalts someone. And so God allowed Joseph unjust prison time to form character in his life. And Joseph tried to get out quickly, but God said, hold on, you got to wait. Now just imagine if the cupbearer remembered Joseph, he would have probably been let go. And he would try to find a job in Egypt and no one may have hired him because he had, oh, he just was released from prison. He probably had a bad employment record there. He wouldn't have got a job. If he went back to his family and went all the way to his father's house, then he would have been with his, uh, his parents and his family, but he wouldn't have been in a position to save them from the famine. And you see how God orchestrates everything ultimately for his good. And so God was working in Joseph's life and he provided hope. And we'll close with this hope this morning. In Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. See, when we lose hope, it makes our heart sick, discouraged, despondent. But we read in Genesis that Joseph held on to hope, a hope that God was with him because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope through the love of God shed in our hearts. And Joseph did not have a sick heart or a sad heart because he had a hopeful heart. And when you and I start losing hope, we start caring, stop caring for others. Hope is not that God will deliver us out of the circumstances, but that God will sustain us as we walk through these circumstances. Our hope is in God, not in the circumstances changing. If our hope is in the circumstances changing, then the longer the trial goes, the more our heart gets sick. This morning, I want to ask you, do you have hope in your waiting? As you are waiting and wondering when something is going to be fulfilled, when something is going to happen, is it in a posture of hope? Or are we becoming sick and despondent and and questioning, should I really love God? Should I follow God? Am I to give up? Romans 5 verse 5 says, And hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not put us to shame because when God promises something, He fulfills it. Maybe not always the way we expect or we see it, but God is faithful. Amen? God is faithful. And because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Hope does not put us to shame. Or as the King James Version says, hope does not disappoint. Hope opens our lives to opportunities and fulfillment. Hope opens doors. Hope is experienced because God pours into our hearts His love. And then we live this life of gratitude and peace and generosity and love. And I believe this hope enabled Joseph that when he was promoted and received that promise, he was able to confront his tragedy and trauma and bitterness and pain by forgiving and reconciling with his brothers. Next week, we're going to look into the reconciliation that Joseph had with his brothers. But it was through that hope, that love that was shed in his heart by God that he was able to forgive his brothers. He was able to provide a place of rescue for them. Hope enables God's appointments and His assignments in our lives. And hope helps us to wait patiently. But as we wait, let us interact with our sovereign God. And Joseph's life and story is a beautiful example of perseverance with patience in the waiting. Waiting for the promise to be fulfilled in our lives. And so as I close, I want to go back and summarize regarding Joseph's robe. Remember I talked about his robe? You remember the first robe that Joseph had, this beautiful ornate robe that was full of different colors, was given to him because he was his father's favorite. It speaks of sometimes in our lives how we have our pride and our privilege. This coat had to be redeemed. And in Genesis 37 verse 31, it says, They got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. Like all of us, we need to surrender our pride and our privileges and find forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. You see, the next time we see Joseph with a robe or a cloak, he's running away from Potiphar's wife and he left his coat, his cloak, when he was falsely accused. Once you and I, our pride and privilege has been surrendered through the blood of Jesus and we are followers of him, we are clothed with a new cloak of righteousness of Christ and we will be tested with trials and temptations and how we respond to those trials will determine whether we wear the next robe. And you see that final robe that was given to Joseph was only after he endured the plain and the pit and Potiphar's house and the prison. Then ultimately he was promoted to the palace. And there when Joseph was tested with Potiphar's wife, he left that cloak and he had to run away. 
And that was that trial, that testing that he had. And then finally we read how Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger, put it on Joseph, and it says, he dressed him in robes of fine linen. This robe is one of authority in purpose or position in life and one of to come in overcoming. Because we read in Revelation 7, 9, how a great multitude that no one can count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne, before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes. You see, Joseph first had the coat of pride and privilege that needed to be surrendered. It was covered in the blood of an animal. Joseph's second coat was a coat that was tested in temptation for which God honored his character. And then because he was tested with that coat, Joseph's final coat was a coat of authority, a coat of position, a coat that he experienced the fulfillment of his position in life. And so the question for you and I this morning is, which coat are you wearing? Are you wearing the coat of pride and privilege that we need to surrender? Or are you in a season that God is testing your character and, and, and what God has put in your life? And are you going to maintain that attitude of joy and patiently waiting in that testing period? Because as you faithfully, as Joseph, imagine if Joseph succumbed to that temptation, he would have never had that coat of authority and purpose in his life. And so in order for you and I, as we endure those trials and temptations, know that God has a purpose, whatever it may look like. Now, we may not be a Joseph ruling over the world or in big areas of responsibility, but whatever God has called us to, let's be faithful. And so as we close this morning, God has a purpose and a calling upon your life. Will you patiently wait for him to unfold his purpose and plan? Second, in our waiting, God wants, wants to work out His character in our lives. He wants to work out the fruit of His Spirit in us. And finally, God is ultimately working all things out for His goodness and His glory. And so, friends, don't get troubled and despondent and discouraged regardless of your waiting period. God is working all things out towards His good and his, for His glory. And we get to partner and be part of that great plan, that great narrative that God is doing. And so we, with that, we rejoice with hope and longing. And so this morning, would you join with me in prayer? There will be a prayer on the screen. And if you feel comfortable to recite this prayer out loud in hope and faith, would you join with me in prayer? Dear Lord, please give me hope and assurance that you are always with me, even amid difficult circumstances. Help me trust in your promises and to believe that you are working all things together for good. Give me the hope and the strength to face each day with confidence and faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.